This program has been approved for one IDCEC CEU. To receive credit for this program, please submit your full name, IDCEC number, program class code, and your summary essay to CEU at IIDA.org. The program class code is located alongside the title of this program on the IIDA Academy page. For a certificate of completion to use toward another certifying body, please submit the same information to CEU at IIDA.org. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Cheryl Durst, the Executive Vice President and CEO of IIDA, and this is our third in the Believe in Better Roundtable series hosted and sponsored by Mohawk. And today we're talking about senior living. And uh, we've got a phenomenal group with us. And uh, I'm gonna, going to uh, introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Royce Epstein. Royce, if you can come on on with me. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm terrific. How are you? Doing great. Um, let me do a little bit of stage setting here and uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, we're in welcome moment right now, and then we'll uh, be participating in a panel discussion with a phenomenal group of panelists who we'll introduce in just a second. And then as just kind of this added bonus feature, which I love about this program, um, is that we're going to uh, transition to some breakout rooms and have some more in-depth conversation post the panel discussion. Uh, and then we'll all come back together at the end of our breakout room and breakout rooms and we'll do some uh, bit of wrap up and some thank yous. And uh, it's gonna be a, a great next hour and a half or so, right, Royce? Oh, I'm so excited. Right. Our conversations and, are always fantastic and thought provoking. And I think this topic in particular, having to do with uh, senior living, especially in this moment of emerging from you know, pandemic life, I think is really uh, relevant and timely. Well, the innovations in, in healthcare and um, senior living is top of mind for some of us. It's coming up sooner rather than later. And uh, it's, such a, it's such a fantastic topic. All of you I know uh, who are watching know Royce Epstein, who is the A&D director for Mohawk. And uh, I love this series, Royce. It's, we've, had a, we've had a wonderful series of conversations and uh, I'm glad to be your partner in crime on this one. Same here, Cheryl. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce two of our panelists. Our first panelist is Hilary DeGroff. She is from Perkins Eastman. Uh, she's an associate principal in Chicago. Welcome, Hillary. Um, Thanks. Thanks for having me. There you are. Mm -hmm. And our second panelist is Siobhan Farvarden. She's a principal at HKS in Dallas. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Nice Hi, to Siobhan. see you. Okay. And I Perfect. think Cheryl is going to introduce our, our special um, expert that we have with us. Yeah. Um, We've got Timothy Peck, who is the Executive Portfolio Director of Health for IDO in New York. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Cheryl, appreciate it. Yeah, glad you're here. How is everybody doing? Great. Great. Everybody's doing good. We're all kind of zooming in from all points, from offices, from home offices. I'm glad everybody's doing well and so glad that you all could participate in this conversation. Let me start, um, with you, Tim, and, and you've got a bit of an interesting and eclectic background, right? Um, I'd love to, for you, by way of, of introduction for our audience, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the, and the work that you do? And what do you do as an executive portfolio director of health at IDO? Sure. Um, yeah, so as the executive portfolio director of health, I get to sit at IDEO, and if you're not familiar with IDEO, you know, uh, world famous kind of design firm uh, that has championed human-centered design, uh, creative confidence, um, and, um, and design thinking for, for 40 years or so. Um, and uh, we sit um, at the intersection of design and everything is really what we look at. Um, we, we work on things as big as systems changes and inventing um, the 
the school system for the middle class in Peru um, to uh, things that you can pick and drop on the floor like insulin pens for Eli Lilly. So um, we're really all over the place in what we, we look at in terms of the subject. But at the end of the day, every the, the theory of, of how we operate is the same, which is human-centered design, which means going and speaking to the people that you're going to build for, that you're designing for, and starting there, rather than being in a room alone and iterating on a blueprint. Yeah. And so um, that's how we start. How we start every project, every time. It's uh, talking to people and the users. Uh, I'm a, an emergency physician by training. That's actually uh, went through that. Um, pathway. Um, I'm a New Yorker, went to NYU for mid school, up to, to Harvard for residency and stayed on as faculty and taught for a while, all the while and building various digital technologies uh, in, in, in medical technology. And then left traditional medicine back in 2014, kind of moved out to Silicon Valley and made my first uh, startup for myself, which was um, a large uh, a digital health company um, and since a couple others. And um, in that process, I had kept bumping into IDEO. Um, I became a client of theirs, a kind of part-time consultant for them um, and really applied everything, uh, all of their theories to the things that I made and found it to be successful every time I, I just listened to what they had told me. So uh, when I was in between um, a startup and a next opportunity. I joined IDEO full time uh, back in March of 2020. Nice, thank you for that. Yeah. So everything's a bit bit pivotal, and I'd love for you to address maybe what are some significant changes that you're seeing at that intersection of health and safety and technology and and the healthcare system. Yeah, so in March of 2020, the entire world changed. I mean, changed before that for most, for much of the world in China and, and then in the US really March, um, the healthcare world, the US healthcare world changed. Um, things as um, sticky as payment models that usually take 15, 20 years to change uh, would change, uh, changed in a matter of a week. A matter of a week, uh, the president wrote a whole bunch of executive orders, Congress passed laws, these things that take um, lobbying efforts for half a decade happened in a week. It was an incredible moment for health. And there was a dam of changes that needed to be made to make the healthcare system better. And they were all just kind of collecting behind that dam because those who are in power, inertia, various reasons, made it so that they couldn't get through. The dam broke open and there's been tons of constraints through, um, through COVID, including not being able to reach people where they are or having people not be able to get to the hospital systems, the constraints of making, making uh, physical spaces where you have to um, separate people that have COVID and not COVID, constraints, 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 and constraints are what innovation and design is made of, right? When you are put up against the wall and you have to make something new. So innovation has been everywhere in design and in medical technology, in the professional scope of what certain people do in medicine has changed. You know, what nurses are do, what doctors do, their very days are different, just like all of ours are as we're talking here on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so that means everything needs a change and that's a perfect time for design to come in. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. Royce. Yeah, so in thinking about all of the things that you're mentioning, you know, we wanna to try to connect this to, to the interior design industry and how when we are designing healthcare spaces for these healthcare systems that are now evolving, um, you know, there are a lot of concerns and questions. Um, the most obvious one is how do we protect each other during this time? Mm -hmm. um, and also what happens to space? Like, do we continue to exist uh, all collectively in the same kind of spaces that we were designing before? Or is it time to rethink how we design healthcare spaces? So I wanna bring Siobhan and Hillary in both in the conversation. Maybe Siobhan, we'll start with you. If you have any thoughts about, um, you know, how we can start to 
collectively as an industry really apply some um, kind of like Tim said, the floodgates are open now. So how can we do that with design to sort of rethink um, healthcare space, but in, in specifically senior living spaces as well, since that's an area of focus that we really want to shine a light on today. Sure. Thanks, Royce. Um, and Tim for that also. You know, I think change is as is, is hard as it is. Nobody wants to, it's not comfortable. It's uh, difficult to, uh, you know, you get in the mode of things and you just want to continue on. But you know, change has, is not new as many would think outside of our industry. Change is not new to the senior living world. I mean, we went through it. Um, we went through a culture change in the past um, 10, 20 years. It was pretty dramatic. Um, you know, if you think of what senior housing was uh, in the 90s and prior to, it's, it's drastically different um, today than what it was. And I think there's some education that we need to um, get out there to the, the broad culture. I think there's people that still think it's bingo and, and jello out there. Um, you know, there's especially the silent um, generation. They're not um, maybe educated and uh, aware of what's, what their choices are. So I think there's some education there that needs to be addressed. Um, and we all know that senior living has been elevated and and the capability for a loved one to be in a senior living community is a lot better than being isolated at home. Um, so I think we just go and we propel that. We use the pandemic, it's kind of the silver lining in all this. It's, let's leverage that um, and not get anemic and uh, continue that, that growth. Um, and then uh, affordability, um, trying to address that. I think the squeaky wheel, uh, it should get the oil. Um, there's potential there to really, really radicalize affordable care. Um, I think we can reach across different sectors, um, working with our, our partners or contractors or policymakers to see what we can do to really crack that nut. Yeah, Hillary, did you wanna to add to that? Sure, yeah, Siobhan, I think you had a really good point about the idea or the preconceived notions around senior living specifically. Um, one of the books on my nightstand, which ties into Tim, what you were speaking to as well, is Dr. Gawande's Being, Being Mortal. And I don't know if anybody here has read that, um, but it's really, for me, it's starting to shed light on what's wrong and what's right um, in embracing age and that process, and then also death. Um, and I think what this COVID era has done, it's it's kind of catapulted us into an age of reimagining what that whole process is like. It's combating ageism, it's blending generations, it's blending the idea of space and, and what it means through the aging process. I think it's a celebration of um, you know, people's third act. It's not the end, it's the next step. Um, and then most importantly, how healthcare fits into wellness, not the other way around. Um, I, I also think that the loneliness pandemic, which was prevalent even before the COVID pandemic, was exacerbated because of the past year and what we all went through. I think we saw a lot of, um, I think we saw a lot of residents decline tremendously, not from COVID, but from pre-existing conditions. And a lot of that decline can probably be contributed to the fact that we lack that social aspect of our lives. Um, I think the challenge of the century for designers moving forward is how to design space to promote social interaction, but in a safe way. And um, we'll, we'll see how it we'll see how it shakes out. I guess that's that's great, Hillary raised some really fantastic points. And I, you know, there's been so much conversation lately um, around even with cause of death with COVID. And, and now there are these distinctions, you either died of COVID or with COVID. And, you know, in that conversation, I think we heard a lot about senior living facilities, particularly at the onset of the, of the pandemic. And right, the facilities were negatively affected, the workers there, their families were affected. Um, open to, to all of you, what, what changes are we seeing in, the, in design and senior living and, and systems in senior living? And how are we thinking about things like room sharing, um, 
ventilation and circulation, even visitation. Um, what are some changes that you all are, are seeing both in, both in the structure and the design and in, in the, the system um, of senior living? And I'll open that up to all of you. Well, Ms. Cheryl, I think it's an opportunity to really um, inject the need for a variety, more variety in communities. Um, you know, we, we can have smaller, more intimate dining. It doesn't need to be one big room or just a few big rooms, but uh, creating more um, house home-like environments. I think uh, the greenhouse model is a great model for that. Um, it, it would probably elevate that. This pandemic would probably elevate the need. Um, you can choose that path or you can kind of model that on the side. Mm -hmm. And I think even prior, uh, you know, Hillary mentioned it, even prior before the pandemic, staff, um, it's a very uh, challenging typology to get really um, talented staff and keep them on and, and not have that re revolving door. Um, many of the staff is a surrogate family to these res residents. Um, either their family is not in the same state or same location um, or, or just not around. And so uh, I think communities are now maybe looking to elevate the staff experience. How do you provide great uh, break rooms? They're not stuck in the basement. They have nice daylit um, spaces. They have access to great outdoors. It's not just a covered sidewalk. Um, so, and then also places for uh, residents to, and, and staff to engage. So they don't have to necessarily be um, siloed. This is staff break room, but you know, this is now family. So this is a place where I can sit with my uh, caregiver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always, I, I think that's a really, really important point. Um, I think we always think about senior living in terms of the resident and we don't think enough about the staff. Um, the level of care that a resident receives is a direct correlation in how we care for the staff. Um, I think, especially in certain levels of care, what they go through um, on emotional and physical level each day for long shifts, it's more than I think most of us can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, yet their employee break rooms at times can be kind of secondary or tertiary thoughts in terms of design. And I think as, um, as we move forward, we're going to be hearing from more and more organizations who are interested in in using those types of amenities or programming to look at recruitment and retention and maybe be able to celebrate it. Mm -hmm. So pulling in workplace and um, nods to what they're doing in, in that practice area, I think that's gonna be critical in the, in the coming years. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, retaining nurses, <clears throat> especially, but um, staff in general has become ex exceedingly hard in this last year and a half um, for a number of reasons. One, it's just a parallel pandemic that happened here as we're talking about, it's just the burnout that's occurred uh, in nursing and in healthcare in general. Um, and people are leaving the nursing profession. There's a lot of, there's about 4 million nurses in the US um, and that's shrinking right now. The other thing is that <laughs> speaking to a nursing home owner last night who's um, can't get nurses to stay in his building because they're going down the road to um, get paid more to do COVID testing than he was able to pay them. Another one um, uh, getting into a competition with a prison who's paying more than they were uh, able to. Um, and so nurses as the shortage happened will have have choices. And so I want to share a story that tells you a little bit about human-centered design as well, which is I, I lived in a nursing home voluntarily for a bit um, and was there playing the role of a patient. I became a doctor and started treating patients myself, learning from the CFO about what the economics were, eventually had a cot in the conference room to do a number of experiments. And one th experiment we did was woke up at one night at one o'clock in the morning and walked around for an hour, went back to sleep. Next two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. At about 5 a.m., there were a whole bunch of uh, CNAs, nursing assistants, sleeping in the lobby. Almost uh, 10, 15. And the first thought was, 
what is happening here? Are, are these people lazy or is, is you know, something wrong? And uh, what I found out is that those people sleep there for a few hours until the daytime visiting hours start. And then, uh, and some of them who don't get a chair in the lobby go sleep in their cars. And then uh, they go to their next job, their day job. And so first of all, just the value of human centered design is putting yourself in the environment to understand the constraints that you would never understand just from talking to people and seeing that uh, was so powerful. But when it comes to employee retention and thinking about their whole lives, not just the lives that are in the box of the nursing home or the assisted living or the senior living that they're in, but designing for how we can make these spaces work for their lives in the way they work, whether that be childcare, um, whether that be sleep as something as simple as sleep and food uh, is something that I think designers will have um, a lot of success helping their clients if they can be the solution for employee retainment. Wow. That's a super powerful story and it illustrates that um, enhanced thinking of designing a space that serves not just a moment in someone's life, but supports their life. Um, that's, thank you for that. That's a, that, is a, that is a really powerful testimony. Right. Yeah, I, I think in hearing your story, Tim, and also hearing Siobhan and Hillary uh, speak, I think you know, when we want to, we know that design is powerful and design can help shape people's lives and can deliver solutions. And I think we're at this very unique moment in time where we can start to collaborate as a design industry with other industries to really enhance, um, like you said, some of the day-to-day, -day, um, not just spaces, systems that are, are built in to um, you know, senior living uh, in order to make it a place that people want to work and, and contribute to their own community. So um, maybe I think this question is probably more suited for Hillary and Siobhan, but Tim certainly chime in if, if you have an answer. What kind of consultants do you guys imagine um, our interior design community you know, will be working with? Like, do we need to start talking more to epidemiologists and psychologists and HVAC experts, of course, now because we're dealing with you know, airborne illness, um, you know, how do you see design expanding from that perspective? Because I think from a very practical level, we're going to have to start to do that. I, I love the idea of looping in psychologists. Um, I think in some ways we have um, typically a, a handful of people on staff who don't have design as, uh, as their first career and do have that type of background. Um, but I think what, what we've been seeing specifically through the past years, um, more interest in, in well. Um, senior living is such a person-centric business and well as compared to lead, I think caters more to the person. Um, and so senior living organizations have tended, especially this past year, to um, I guess just be a little bit more versed in it, whether or not they're going for certification or not they want to at least incorporate some of those, those things into any new design. So that's what we've been seeing for the most part. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Oh, go ahead, Royce. I was just gonna say, Well has been doing an excellent job too of promoting themselves because you know now they have a commercial with JLo and um, uh, I forget her name now, Lady Gaga and you know all these actors. And you know, even sort of just lay people in our lives like are starting to hear about well and really understand what it is. So I think sometimes that's what it takes. Like something has to kind of go mainstream for it to come back into our industry and become even stronger. Um, you know, we can all be proponents of well, but like our clients also need to you know demand these things. Um, so I think it'll make it you know even more prevalent as we move forward. Um, I also wanted to touch on equity because I think within healthcare itself, is, there's a very big issue of equity. Like all senior living facilities are, are not created equal. You know, some are very posh and some are very sort of baseline at how they're designed and the services you get. So of course there's varying levels of quality of care. Um, and Tim, you probably have seen that as well. So what are some of the issues that are being tackled around equity today in senior living and what are some of the solutions that um, you have encountered or, or could maybe suggest to our audience? 
I think um, getting into more in, in urban mixed use environments, um, I think there's opportunities here for us to partnership with adjacent properties. And then as a result, that's gonna reduce the requirement for um, senior communities to upgrade. Uh, you know, a lot of these um, common areas will have to be um, renovated every five, 10 years to be relevant. So if we can leverage the outer community, um, not only can you save some money and, and, and within your building, but you're also engaging um, people within your community. So you feel more of a place. Uh, so I think that's one way we could do it. Um, and then also in the case of resiliency, uh, there's uh, opportunities to microgrid a, a, a larger area, not just your senior community, but um, there could be other buildings that could benefit from um, the generators that are required by code. So I think there's opportunities here. Um, one, of, one of the things that's, I think, been a hot topic, people continue to talk about it, but nothing's necessarily been solved yet on the senior living side is um, how to deal with the middle income. We have so many communities that cater to that upper echelon, you know, the one percenters who have just enough assets to put down um, the entry fees and, and the exorbitant monthly fees. Um, and as the generational shifts start to happen, um, when our generation starts getting in there, we're not going to come in with the same assets that our grandparents or our parents had. And so I think the market is going to start to demand a change. And one of those things is is looking at how the middle income can start being, I think, incorporated into the equation. And I think that goes back to what Siobhan was saying too. When you start minimizing the common area spaces, reducing overhead, can you start recognizing in an urban environment, even revenue streams through dining venues and, this and the like? Um, maybe you look at residents participating in a co-op type of way. I think there's just big, shifts that have to start to happen and in, in the operations policy side um, to, to get this to all work, but I have faith that we'll see it in our lifetime. Yeah. I'd love to talk about um, a huge shift that happened again in March um, that has very big implications to the built environment for, um, for senior living and um, it's a great equalizer, which is telemedicine. Mm. So um, in uh, right before the pandemic, about 17, 18% of doctors had ever used tel telemedicine. Um, later in May, when it was measured again, it was uh, 48%. Now it's 85%. So all of a sudden it's adopted, it's a thing. And that had to do again with these law changes allowing for people to get paid to do telemedicine. Whereas before there were a lot of restrictions and licensing restrictions. Uh, I put it another way for this population, Medicare beneficiaries, those who have Medicare as their payment source, um, had a 11,000 percent increase in telemedicine usage, which is like infinity or Bitcoin or whatever uh, adoption curve you can think of, or I guess Bitcoin as of like four days ago, just a stretch. Um, but yeah, so it, an enormous adoption of this. And the reason it's a great equalizer is because it allows you to get care to people where they are rather than bringing those people to the care. And uh, many people associated this with rural areas. And so getting to uh, the rural areas where access was difficult, but in senior living, urban areas are just as much of a desert in terms of getting providers to come into these buildings. And so being able to get the you know, world-class providers to you by telemedicine is enormous. But this means for the built environment is that we have to be thinking about what do we do with our TVs? Um, how do we make those into consoles that, our, uh, that people can interact with? Um, how do we have room in the rooms for carts or uh, various pieces of equipment that might come in that are you know, what we call telepresentation? Um, and this has also spurred on an entire movement of remote monitoring. So um, having various patches on you, having wires connected, et cetera, 
um, and what does that mean for how you're building these um, building these rooms? Um, this is even spread to dialysis, which is uh, the the mechanism to kind of clean your blood when your kidneys don't work. Usually, you go to this, this huge machine in a building somewhere outside of the senior living to do that. And there's been now uh, telemedicine laws and, and and new technologies that have pushed it to have these machines become smaller and go into the building to, to treat people. A lot of these buildings are not made for this machine to be rolled in there. So um, we have to think about what this new frontier of health means for the built environment that's going to house it. I think what's really interesting about what you just said too is how it relates to this division of care in senior living, because when you start to bring care to the person, you no longer have to segregate based on, on their needs. You don't have to have independent, assisted, skilled. Um, maybe even you start to look at desegregating memory care residents um, so that everyone is together despite where you are in the spectrum. Um, so I, I, I think going back to that blending of generations and the blending of needs, I think we're gonna start to see that kind of level out. That's a great perspective, Hillary. It's, a, it's definitely an inclusive perspective of how we, we think about, right? That, that you, the word you used was desegregation and um, you know, less about the categories putting people in categories, but bringing healthcare to them as opposed to putting them in categories. Tim, you started touching on this conversation um, around the adoption of technology in senior living. Um, what about AI? Are there AI tools that have become more prevalent? And, and what I'm interested in is this kind of collision of technology, but then also focusing on um, the natural as well, like um, use of natural light in rooms and biophilia and access to outdoor space and green space. Um, can you talk a little bit about that collision, but I'm also interested in how, how AI is being used in, in senior care. Yeah, there's a lot in that question. Um, <laughs> I think uh, one great place that AI has had already been making an impact, but now has gotten more adoption is through fighting this loneliness and isolation parallel pandemic. Um, Alexa and Amazon are doing a, a program around this to have the smart speaker be able to speak um, to residents uh, and almost have talk therapy of sorts uh, with, with people. Um, and so, you know, that's AI that's already been in action and now is uh, coming to mm -hmm. fruition for this population. You know, it gets back into remote monitoring and remote monitoring, we often think about our Fitbits or Apple watches and that's all true. And there's a lot of AI um, involved in that. Uh, and, you know, uh, but it all, all together, the environment of all these different remote monitoring pieces, including bed sensors, when people are getting out of bed or if they're not moving in bed and therefore they're more susceptible to a pressure ulcer. Um, all of this information together, being able to be um, sucked into a, a singular data source is something that I know of a number of companies that are working on right now mm -hmm. to make predictions on the risk profile of those, of those, of those people. Um, and a lot of that has to do with movement and tethering both movement and tethering. So when you're tethered, meaning you have um, an IV in, or you have a wheelchair, or you have something that you're touching that's keeping you in one environment and not allowing you to go to the others, you are so much more susceptible to delirium or confusion, more susceptible to bed sores, more susceptible to falls, um, et cetera. And so the, uh, the very cool AI things that I've been seeing in terms of taking all that data are trying to get people moving. Um, and so there's um, a, pa a paradox here because to get them moving and to, and to sense them, you need to put things on the people, right? And so in that act, you're tethering them you're tethering. too. <laughs> 
there's this uh, great design challenge going on with a lot of smart minds thinking about how do you untether people while not tethering them. So um, yeah, one, one place this is all happening. Yeah, I, I echo that, Tim. I, there's a, I forget the name of the company, but there's a device that you can put in the corner of the room and it can really just, it's, it's tracking, it's an algorithm. Um, it's tracking basically what are your daily movements. And, and if there's any deviation from that, that's a, a, an indication that something's up, but you're not tethered. So, but then the challenge is to the operator, okay, now what am I responsible for? What am I legally responsible for? So it's like, where do you draw that line? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And then that collision between technology and what's, what's natural. Um, how are we meeting the needs for um, green space and daylight? Hillary, I see you nodding. Yeah, I, um, it, it resonates with me because I feel like before the past year happened, um, sometimes outdoor space can be on the chopping block when it comes down to a VE. So landscaping kind of goes away, outdoor furniture is just benches. Um, and now it's the top priority because it's, it's that flexible space um, that allowed people to, to thrive during the past year, regardless mm -hmm. of climate. People, you know, in Chicago, we, we stuck through it. We put on our winter coats, went to have a beer with a neighbor outside around the fire pit. Um, I think we're gonna be seeing more and more of that extension of, of space into the outdoors um, in a lot of different ways. And again, that connectivity. Mm -hmm. So I think it was always in the back of our minds is important, but now that we needed it the past year, it's gonna be, it's gonna be the first thing on everybody's minds. Yeah, yeah. And all of you have alluded to this, the loneliness epidemic, a connection to nature. There are studies you know, about a connection to nature lessens those feelings of loneliness. You can be alone in nature, but just the very fact of nature lessens those feelings of, of loneliness. So a very important part of, of an intervention for loneliness there. Bryce? Yeah, so Hillary, I wanna continue this, this thought about sustainability. Um, how are you seeing like your, your work and your firm's work really um, pushing the boundaries of sustainability um, during this time, especially uh, in the senior living market. Like, you know, we, we always talk in our industry just at large about biophilia and daylighting. And like Cheryl said, connecting, like as humans connecting to nature is such a powerful um, sort of, uh, you know, design move, if you will, and it's necessary. Um, are you seeing any other um, kind of models of sustainability or things that, you know, people should really be on the lookout, especially in the senior living market? Yeah, like I, I always think um, the material selections, that's kind of the easy part. Yeah. The, the challenging part that's the most satisfying is designing space that provides a variety of outlets for people. So it provides moments of solitude, moments of discovery. We're starting to talk about biophilic principles. So like um, moments of socialization, um, moments of play or solitude, like all of these things are really, really critical for our well-being. Um, and so I think you guys kind of touched on thinking about the psychology of space and how those things can start to support every single person, even though we're all very different. And so as designers, I think we have to, we have to really come at it from a human standpoint and kind of go back to the roots and inherently that will become biophilic design or sustainable design. So. Yeah, I talk a lot about expanding the definition of not just design, but also sustainability. And I think you're kind of touching on that here. Like, I think we all need to come together as an industry and really figure out how to stretch those definitions to be more inclusive and to think more about people's experiences. And not everybody is the same. We all come to life from a different perspective, but also get treated differently when we are in different space. Um, and so, um, you know, I think as designers trying to kind of expand that and, and bring new ways of, of, or new perspectives maybe of thinking about how we can kind of um, implement, you know, like bringing in psychology into our practice. Of course, we're not trained psychologists, but again, working with 
consultants that can help us expand these definitions. So we can design for you know neurodiversities, and we can design for just like you were saying, different. Um, you know, we don't like in healthcare. We don't have to be pigeonholed. Like you know, healthcare can come to us. So you know, how do how do we as an industry learn how to do that? So I think we do have to have sort of a collective open mind to kind of expand our definitions of design. I also think that this generation of designers, we are setting ourselves up for success in, in doing all of that because our backbone as a generation, I, I think personally, I think we have humanity and empathy and we just have a more emotional connectedness than maybe previous generations, not in a bad way, but I think where there's just more, um, there's more information out there to start to understand and, and navigate all of those things. And so being able to apply it to our work, it will just, I think it'll just allow us to really, um, really thrive. Yeah, and we can connect that too to the tools that Tim was talking about too. You know, previous generations didn't have monitors in the same way that we have now. You know, my dad actually just got a pacemaker and I was absolutely, um, blown away at the technology that he can, you know, literally check on his phone how his heart is doing and his doctor can also check and they will alert him if they see that something is wrong. And I was just like, whoa, like, how is that even possible today? You know, so it is amazing Like, technology really can change like an individual's life. It can change a generation. Um, and I do think you're right, Hillary, that, you know, especially Gen Z as they're starting to graduate college and come into the workforce, you know, they are, they tend to be a more empathic generation. And I, I hope you're right that we'll see them expand this idea of sustainability and design to be much more humanistic. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I love that commentary and you companion that empathy with an abiding awareness of dignity, right? Um, the dignity of the human beings in the space, the dignity of the experience. I think about Tim, Tim's story about the nursing assistants you know, sleeping in chairs or sleeping in their car. Um, it's the dignity of the entire experience that we are forever concerned um, of, but I think we've become more aware um, of the increasing, you know, the dignity imperative is what I like to call it. So great discussion. Thank you all so much. We are going to move into our breakout rooms. Um, we're going to do some some wrap up. How about if we have some conversation about what everyone talked about? Um, anybody want to start? What did you talk about in your breakout rooms? Breakout rooms. How? Um, what are we seeing? Some some changes in how we think about perceptions uh, around aging, and and how can how can design support um, both the thought and the population? I'll go. I'll start. <laughs> hey, Giselle. <laughs> um, our group talked about the um, inclusive inclusivity and including all generations, uh, and that was good from you know uh, preschool all the way up to the actual community. The other main topic was uh, basic community and bringing in, uh, allowing the seniors or those of us that are aging to participate in college coursework, whether teaching or taking those classes. So that's really immersing ourselves, immersing the uh, senior living into the communities there in the colleges. And then I think the third point was interesting about the new products and the new product was mentioned by Shaw uh, that documents movement in the room. So that's a, a new uh, uh, technology that's gonna be able to support the, those that are in the community as well. Those are three big takeaways I thought we had mentioned. I really like your number two, um, which was kind of reaping the benefits of an intergenerational community yeah. by taking yeah. programs. But then on the flip side, you know, we have a huge shortage of geriatric care people in the industry, and that will only continue. Mm -hmm. And so what's really interesting about creating intergenerational communities is having those college students or any student start to see what senior living is or what, what that generation can, can give back. Um, and so you're creating that, not only the, you're combating the ageism, but you're also creating that interest or that opportunity to get interested in that, that career. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. Anybody else? I'll go. Yay. We look at it from a slightly different uh, perspective, just a slightly different. Uh, we, we were talking about the first question, which is what does aging mean? 
uh, to us and pretty much everybody weighed in. And one of the things that we were able to, to glean and to take away is that this generation that we're currently dealing with, the baby boomers, they're really different. They're very different than any other generation prior to them. And so their way of looking at themselves as aging individuals, I think is we all thought is fundamentally changing how people are viewing them, viewing the idea of aging as well. Because uh, they're going kicking and screaming, which I think sets a great precedent for everybody else on this call. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I believe uh, we chatted a bit about the second question and I just wanna make sure, how can, we, how can design support this population? Um, and, and we all kind of came to a very similar conclusion because you know this through this uh, convergence of tech and in medicine, they're living longer. Um, but there's a lot to be learned from even a sociological perspective on how to treat how to treat these folks, but certainly how to design for them because they have a lot of agency as they certainly feel like it, and something that we have to acknowledge in our design practice. Um, but anybody else from my team who wants to jump in, please, please do. Haley? I think you did. Tra Tracy did beautifully. I think you <laughs> captured what we talked about really well. Awesome. I think one of the big things is just is continuing to develop environments where people can thrive and be their best selves as they, as they you know, go through their, their journey of life. Yeah. And one thing that Haley was very quick to comment on and, and, and I thought was such a great point was that we have to design for all of these different cohorts because there's different types of people and uh, uh, personality types, agents. There's some folks who are extremely outgoing and want that community. There's some folks who are more introverted. Uh, and you know we're finding out in this time of COVID, we, we actually touched upon this, how some of the introverts now are doing really, really well since the lockdown and how it's kind of anxiety inducing as people are coming out of this moment in a positive and good way. Um, but to keep in mind the different folks that is that designers have to prioritize. Thank you. One of the things, oh, I don't know if it's okay to talk yeah, go now. Go ahead, jump right in. in. In our group, one of the things we talked about is that because people are living longer than they ever have before, that retirement is such an extended period now that, and one of the things we were discussing is you know, how do you just break off and say, okay, now I'm retired, or is there a way to transition and say, okay, I'm going to work 40 hours a week, now I'm going to 30, now 20, now 10, and in that, within that range, there's overlap and mentoring that happens with the younger generations as they're moving up in whatever field they're working in, and, and how do we support those and maintain flexibility in the spaces we design to support that kind of work? Judy, that's such a great comment. I've been uh, hearing a lot lately about PIR, phased in retirement, um, which is exactly what you just described, that people aren't just stopping working, they're just, they're easing out of working and into something else, or a lot of companies are establishing an emeritus title. And so a founder um, or a CEO moves into an emeritus kind of position and they're not working 40 hours a week. They might be working 10 hours a week. And like you said, they're, they're mentoring or some folks are starting completely second careers. Um, uh, I heard someone say the other day that they have failed at retirement um, <laughs> because they just couldn't do what they expected retirement to be. And I think once upon a time, we always thought that retirement meant golfing and sitting on a beach, but sometimes retirement means you're embarking on a whole other career. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. That, that was also brought up of like spaces that are interconnected where if you have a senior living facility that's connected to a university or a, even a high school, that you know, people who are in the senior living area can go take classes at the university and or if it's a high school, high school students could come do their choir practice in the senior living facility. There's this um, you know, symbiotic relationship that's happening between age groups and populations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our group discussed a lot of the same topics. I think the only thing that, that we touched on that maybe we haven't really talked about yet is the fact that um, property and land usage is, is becoming a premium. So how do we accommodate um, 
the, the lack of square footage, right? By creating co-housing, intergenerational housing, knowing that we have generational differences. Um, but, you know, also the argument, I liked uh, Lisa's example where, you know, in, in Portland, you know, properties at a premium. So obviously a lot of people are, are building ADUs on their own property. And then we did talk about, you know, senior living on, on college campuses and whatnot. And how do you, how do you also integrate healthcare like physical therapy and, and different modalities along those lines. So our, our conversation was a lot of the same stuff, which is good. Yeah. So, um, so our group um, also talked a lot about the same things that we've already heard, but um, something that, and I can't remember her name, I, I'm not seeing her uh, picture right now, but um, that stood out was uh, dignity in choice and to continue you know, to um, make sure that we keep our elders' um, dignity intact is be being able to give them choices and flexibility. Um, and I think we have all seen that that has been increasing. Um, and I, I loved the comment about um, the boomers going kicking and screaming and how they're, they're probably transitioning um, all of our viewpoints of aging. Um, so I, I hope that that is true. Um, or I don't know if I should say it that way, but I, I think that that was a great way to, to look at it. Um, so, and, and we also touched on the mid-market um, and that the, um, that it doesn't have, we don't have to necessarily, I guess, create luxurious spaces, I think was, was the point that we kind of touched on, but, give, but creating spaces where a variety of activities and programs particularly led by the residents. So the residents, again, are engaged in part of making those choices and, and um, leading the, their activities um, in those facilities. Perfect. Anybody else? I think there were more groups. All right, come on. I know somebody needs to report. Royce, were you in a group? I was in Judy's group. You were in Judy's group? Such okay. a beautiful, eloquent job of relaying what we discussed. Yeah. Did we capture all the groups? I guess so. We may have. We may have panelists. Um, I'd love to ask you all um, for some insight and opinion on um, you all have been in this space for um, for a while. How have you seen attitudes around aging shifting? Hillary, you've been doing this for your entire career, right? Almost. Yeah. yeah. I always like to, I've in the past, I've always introduced senior living with like a caveat, but I feel like more recent, recently, people think it's cool. Like senior living is totally cool. I've always thought that, but now I'm seeing like people are like, you know, shaking their head and like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I think there's a shift in, in what people's perception of it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that will continue. Yeah. So I'm hopeful. Yeah. Good to hear. Well, Siobhan. Sh uh, I agree with Hillary. It's great to see that that shift as we're chipping away at it and um, looking forward to this next decade. I think we're going to see a lot more partnerships. I think, um, you know, skilled nursing had its challenges and we're going to see healthcare systems come up and prop them up um, because that's with all, all the Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, um, it's been a challenge for them. And I think um, they'll bring their expertise and it'll just really elevate uh, skilled nursing Great. And uh, Tim? Uh, I'll go back to the, the, the hyper changes that happened for the pandemic. I think um, congregate living is what is often called uh, in terms of uh, being together has uh, had a spotlight on it from the beginning, right? Because that's where our first outbreaks happened mm -hmm. with the pandemic in the US. And so it kind of woke people up to the fact that um, this is where our uh, population lives, right? Uh, in, in terms of the aging population, this is where they are, not necessarily as much in the home. And 
there were a lot of negatives that we uncovered during that time and things that were already known to people in the industry, but became known to the populace at large. At this point, now there's this opportunity to show where both changes can be made on the places where there were negatives, as well as start to spotlight some of the positives. Um, and one of the, uh, I, I listened to a podcast the other day from the Times and it was about um, kind of the spring awakening of people coming out of their rooms and finally getting to eat dinner together and, and lunch <laughs> together and meals together. And there was a story of a love affair and like it was, it was absolutely amazing this this blossoming of of uh, people coming together like that hope is something that we can do a better job of highlighting now that we're in a moment where there is a little bit of hope in the air of what what the world will look like again and um i just hope that the spotlight stays on this population as we have that awakening yeah i love I also, that i it, sorry cheryl can That's i good. just go add for it more thing? yeah um, I also think that it's not just the design side that's pushing things forward. It's the organizations who are forward thinking and trying to be in that transformative position to be the leaders in the industry. Um, you know, I, I had my first client, I never thought this would happen, but I had my first client recently describe their vision of what their community would be based on a Wes Anderson movie. I mean, like, is that not freaking cool? Yeah, I want to. I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, things are changing. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's great, and I I love Tim your comment on on hope and optimism, right? And does design is the most optimistic of professions. Uh, we're in the business of optimism. Uh, we see the best and we want the best for uh, for clients and and end users and for community, and so. I absolutely have great appreciation for every single one of you and the work that you're doing. And thank you for, for joining us today for this endeavor. Royce, you wanna yeah. have some closing thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone. This has been really um, enlightening, but also enjoyable. I think it's nice to, to think about the future for once in a really optimistic way and to also see how we can all play a, a part in that. Um, everyone, you know, that's the thing I believe in in design is that we all have a role to play and we come together to do that beautifully. And so um, that's why we have these conversations and we're going to keep discussing and keep pushing design forward. Um, so thank you, Siobhan and Hillary and Tim for being on our panel. Thank you, Cheryl, for moderating. Thank you, the IIDA team for organizing this with our Mohawk team. And thank you all of our guests for attending. We really appreciate you spending time with us, sharing your thoughts. Let's stay in touch and continue the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Thanks all. Good health, okay. good vibes, be well. good thoughts. Thank Everybody you. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, Rice. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Bye, Dom. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone.